Hello, yes, it's Joe here, live on Joyrider TV, coming from the Wild Wind Bar. It is absolutely blowing dogs off chains today, more than it has blown dogs off chains before in recent weeks. Uh, so much so that there's been very little sailing going on this afternoon, just a couple of lasers. Um, apologies for the uh, dropped out stream uh, that uh, from before. It was, I believe, possibly because it's so windy that the wind is upsetting the Wi-Fi and 4G connection, which is why I've had to change location. Hello to everybody who's just tuning in. Um, just trying to... Um, uh -huh. All right, we've got Nick. Hi, Nick. How are you doing? Hello, Kurosh. Great to have you on board. Um, just try, trying to get this working nicely um, at this time. All right. Well, anyway, hello to everybody who's tuning in. I'm not able to get the live chat up at the moment. Why is that? Thank you for bearing with me. All right. Okay. Yes. Now we're now we're along. Nick is hopefully getting the boat out of storage this weekend. Great stuff, Nick. I hope that you do. Hello, Sewell Lee. Hello, Jeff. In Hong Kong. Great to have you on board. All right. So we have got a fair amount of preloaded questions to uh, go through. Hello, Kai. Uh -huh, that's Kai, who is a wild wind regular. He might be coming to help us on the beach towards the back end of the season. Yes, it is probably gusting something like 35, maybe 40 knots this afternoon. I did go sailing this morning. Uh, and of course, as soon as I put my toe in the water, the wind dropped off. Uh, but now it has come back uh, as it would. All right, so I'm just going to go in for the first preloaded question. And this one comes from Stephen, who I believe has just tuned in. Hello, Stephen. Uh, Stephen at Grafham uh, in the UK says, what is the best baton tension configuration? Should it be just taking out the wrinkles or more shape at the bottom or something else? Uh, if, is it like if you put on too much bat and tension, you will end up hooking the leech? OK, so bat and tension. Uh, what you want to be doing on. It depends on the type of boat to a certain degree on a less sophisticated boat. That's the wind that is actually buffeting my screen at the moment. I might have to change down to a smaller computer. Um, yet with on a less sophisticated boat, you may need to put in more batten tension. So perhaps if we start with the more sophisticated boats like the F-18, uh, a lot of people out there sailing NACRA into 20s, I have seen uh, the Tornado, those kind of boats. With the batten tension, what you want to be doing is just pulling enough tension on so that it takes the creases out of the batten pocket and then the rest of the sail shape you should be able to control with the pre-bend in the mast and the downhaul there's no need to put on more batten tension on an f-18 style boat for example whereas with something like a hobie 16 or um, maybe like a, a dart 18 any boat which doesn't have the option to pre-bend the mast then if you are looking to get maximum amount of power out of your sail, it is worth putting a bit more batten tension on to put more curve into the sail, which is going to give you more power. Then, uh, as Stephen asked, is it then worth putting more tension in the bottom and less as you get to the top? Well, because of the length of the battens, it will naturally be easier to put more curve into the lower ones 
And because the shorter battens, you're going to really find it hard putting the same amount of tension or getting the same amount of curve in a shorter baton. So you'll actually naturally, with the same amount of effort, be putting in the right amount of curve so that you're getting more um, shape in the bottom of the sail and less shape as you move up the sail. So there we are regarding baton tension, generally speaking. But on the F-18 style boats, just take the creases out. On the Hobie 16 style boats, uh, put a bit more in for a bit more shape. All right, who have we got checking in? Hello, Jeff in Hong Kong. Great to have you on board. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we've got Ollie Smith from the Wild Wind Workforce flying the flag there. Great to have you on board, Ollie. We've got Craig at 2.40 a.m. in New Zealand. That is some pure dedication, Craig. Thanks for tuning in. We've got Sebu, uh, who is actually here at the moment. I'm not going to disclose his real name because uh, he's, uh, you know, there is what, uh, yeah. Anyway, hello. Uh, great to have you tuning in. We've got Mike in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Hello, Mike. We've got M. Jasmine in Hong Kong as well. Yeah, so quite a lot of Hong Kong action today. GamePro37 in Spain. Hello. And Timon in Germany or could be Austria. Sorry, I've forgotten. Um, but thanks for tuning in. Yeah, it's all it's all good. And then we've got China Clipper 1. Love your Hobie 16 videos. Makes me remember my experience in Hawaii when we finally hit the trade winds in a cove sailing with my wife and a captain we hired for the experience great stuff that sounds like a lot of fun especially in hawaii that would definitely be on the list timon is in germany just to clarify all right we've got adam tuning in in melbourne it must be sort of what is it one o'clock in the morning there Hello, Frank. Frank in Canada, of course. We've got Steve-O down on the south coast of the UK. Oh, summer has arrived in the UK, apparently. Steve-O's just off for a sup. All right, we'll just take a look at our next preloaded question. And this one comes from... Ah, oh, this one would have been good with the whiteboard, but because I've had to change location, I haven't got any apparatus with me all right so the next one is coming from christopher who says i sometimes have trouble discerning when i'm on a beam reach i'm a bit downwind or a bit upwind or if i'm truly on a beam reach yeah i've been hearing this quite a lot actually uh lately uh there's a bit of concern about being on a beam reach because of power control when it's windy. Um, he continues, if I understand correctly, in order to depower, we steer away from the beam and not which side I'm on. Okay, I think what uh, Christopher might be doing there is just overcomplicating things a little bit. So how we determine what point of sail we're on. If you're sailing upwind, we determine that by pulling the jib in tight and then sailing by watching the telltales on the jib. If we're sailing downwind, we deter so on a broad reach, we determine what course we're sailing by looking at the streamers, the tapes, your wind indicators on the front of the boat. And we're looking for those going straight across the boat at 90 degrees. If those are on 90 degrees, then that means we are on a true catamaran sailor's broad reach. And then pretty much anything in between is a bit of a vague area of it might be a beam reach, might be a close reach, but it doesn't really matter too much. If you are sailing in one of those zones like close reach, beam reach, all you really need to worry about is where do you want to go point your boat in that direction 
and then play the main sheet and the jib to control the uh, the power. So don't worry so much about steering the boat for the power, just play the main sheet. So it's only actually on the broad reach when those tapes are going across at 90 degrees when you want to be turning downwind if you want to be losing a bit of power. So if you're on a broad reach, tapes at 90 degrees, gust hits, ease a bit of main sheet out, turn more downwind, and then once you're on your new course, uh, if the boat has settled down, you can bring the main sheet back in. Um, on the upwind course, as you're sailing along, if you get too much power, you can allow the boat to turn up towards the wind slightly. Um, but if you have to turn up so far that the boat starts losing speed, at that point, you want to ease a bit of main sheet as well so that you're not losing speed. So a combination of steering and main sheet. Whereas if you're on a close reach or a beam reach, then the beam reach, especially a bit further away from that close hauled course, if you want to lose power, just sheet out the main. And if you've got a crew who can sheet out the jib, then sheet out the jib as well. And that will take the power off. Um, you can on a beam reach and on a close reach, if you want to lose power, so perhaps you feel that you're not quick enough on the main sheet, you can turn the boat up into the wind as well. Uh, so there we go. That is how we're addressing power control on uh, those points of sail. All right. Who else have we got tuning in here? Um, oh, Stephen says, 33 knot squall on Saturday, no crew. Any tips on depowering before heading up from a broad reach? Uh, downhaul was on to full beans, ended up driving both bows straight down. Yeah, that can be quite um, intimidating because, as we know, when it's windy, the bear away turning from upwind to downwind can be a little bit emotional at times. But let's not underestimate the pure emotion that is involved in turning the boat from downwind to upwind as well. Um, to make that transition from downwind to upwind, um, what you want to be doing is doing it quickly with a lot of confidence. Uh, if you can be out on the trapeze before you turn up through that angle, it will really work in your advantage because you're able to get your weight back a bit more you can really see what's going on and you've got a lot more um control over the boat but what you could do is as you head up even ease a bit of main sheet as you head up because it's that from the broad reach as you go up you're going to go through the beam reach before you get to the upwind and it's that beam reach which is where uh, you're going to be coming through the most power, which is trying to knock you over sideways. So ease the main sheet out as you come up towards the wind, and that should get you through. But you have to do it reasonably quickly and with confidence. And if you're coming up, the boat starts flying a hull, you've just got to keep going up until you get to that close hauled course. And then when you get there, then you're feel a lot more in control but you've just got to keep going there we are good luck to everybody who's going to be heading up in strong winds this weekend all right kai rigging the a cat is finished going out on one seat berlin now enjoy the afternoon great have a great sail there kai hope the wind is good for you Oh, and Stephen says he had the self-jibing jib on at the time when he was going down the mine shaft. That is emotional. All right. All right. Kurosh asks to go as fast as possible. Hope everyone can hear me, by the way, uh, just with the wind noise that we're experiencing just now. If I'd have known, I would have been in an indoor facility. Um go as fast as possible would it be best to shift 
weight more away from deck and transpose the power to forward. If main sheet is loosened, would it not slow down the boat? Yeah. Um, oh, if you talk about heading up. So um, it's like, because as you head through that beam reach, you might actually get more power, which might make the hull lift quite violently. So if you're really concerned when heading up, sheet out a bit, and that really is going to help. Um, it's going to help your confidence, but get up through that angle as quickly as you can. All right, Craig B, what would you recommend for replacing a Hobie 16 rudder pin? Aluminium or stainless steel? That's a great question. Um, yeah, two, there are on Hobies, there's two choices of rudder pin. As Craig has said, there's the aluminium or the stainless. Now, the, uh, the stainless one is going to give you, well, it's not going to wear down over time. The aluminium rudder pins do wear down over time, which is going to create more play in your rudder system. Um, but the reason why the aluminium rudder pins are a good idea is because the worst thing you can do with your rudders is hit the bottom going backwards. If you hit the bottom going backwards, the rudder is not going to kick up. So you would end up either breaking your rudder blade, perhaps breaking the gudgeon, the part that holds the rudder pin, maybe even breaking the back of the boat to some degree. Or if you've got an aluminium rudder pin in there, you're going to snap the rudder pin. Those aluminium rudder pins are designed to snap if you hit something going backwards. Yes, you're going to damage your rudder blade as, more, as well. But if you had a stainless rudder pin in there, the damage that could be done would be much more severe. So for that reason, I would recommend the aluminium rudder pins on the 16, especially. Um, on the bigger boats like the Tigers, um, the F-18s, then for some reason, I prefer the stainless steel rudder pins. And to be honest, I don't really know why I prefer that. Um, I think perhaps I just don't feel that there's as much risk in hitting the bottom going backwards. But why is that? I don't even know. But that's always been the way. Uh, because with the, the Hobie Tiger especially, they've always, since the start, been supplied with stainless rudder pins, which to me just felt like the industry standard for that type of boat. So that is uh, what we're using. So I hope that helps there, Craig. All right, Luke, are you looking for crew at Wild in some weeks this summer coming from a Dutchie sailing instructor? Yeah, Luke, um, send me an email. Uh, you'll find my email address in any of the videos in the description and we can talk um we're certainly in the market for sailing instructors if you are especially if you're available from the middle of august till the end of september for example then that is a real that is a time of the season when we are actually looking at the moment a little bit short of instructors on the beach so yes and yes, but it does, to a certain degree, depend on when. All right, Frank, how are you doing? Um, have you ever had certain parts, boat parts, made for you by a machinist because parts could be so expensive? No, we were looking at some, like the rudder bush, especially uh, we were looking at getting some made, but it ne for one reason or another, it never happened. And we've just continued getting our parts directly from Hobie, which has been, um, yeah, it's more expensive than it needs to be. But what's nice with Hobie is when you buy the parts from Hobie, you know that they are going to be absolutely perfect pretty much every time. So we are very happy with buying parts from Hobie. Noah has found a laser. Congratulations, Noah. Great stuff. You're going to have a great time with that bad boy, I can tell. Right, I'm just going to look up the next 
um, preloaded question. This one comes from Kyle. Uh, we're back on to battens, actually. Kyle says, I've had some trouble with the top two battens on my Hobie 16 mainsail popping over once I complete attack. This happens sometimes, especially on lighter wind days. I usually have to shake the sail and manually to pop them over. I have the old blue battens from 1986 in my sail. Do you know any way to correct this? I'm thinking of sanding down or tapering these two battens um, towards the luff to make them less stiff. Maybe I'm putting too much tension on these bad boys. What are your thoughts? All right. So this is quite an interesting question there, Kyle. Um, and in fact, the art sending your battens down to make them less stiff. But I would guess. Oh, my connection is unstable. Please wait while we try to reconnect you. OK, we're back on. Um, yeah, it would. I would say that the, the reason your battens aren't popping in the top of the sail is actually because they're too soft. If you've got a batten that's too soft, this is going to mean you're going to have a lot more curve in the batten, uh, which means it's a lot less likely to pop through when you tack or jibe, which means you have to do the old kind of, it's almost like rowing a boat to get the batten to pop. Um, whereas if you put stiffer battens in, they would be more straight which means they don't have to go through such an angle to pop over. So in short, stiffer battens in there is going to mean you should get rid of that problem. Thank you very much. Good question. All right. We've got Hayden on board. Hello, Hayden. Hayden says, I was watching an old tips for cat sailors video where I saw that you use an aluminium pipe as a tiller extension. Do you know what the diameter of that pipe was? I got one and it seems a bit heavy. Yeah, the, it is a, it's a bit of a trick shot with getting the right tube for the tiller extension because I think if you buy the tube in certain countries, it's whether they measure the tube um, in imperial or metric uh, numbers. I think if you... If you buy a tube in France, you can get the perfect tube for a tiller extension. Our tiller extensions that we use here, they are a bit heavy because they've got a thicker wall. Whereas um, we did buy some tubes. Um, I think they were in the UK. I decided to try going down one wall thickness size and then they were very light, but even if you looked at them wrong, if you held it a bit too tight, you'd get a bend in it. So you do need that wall thickness to give the tiller extension its uh, strength so that it doesn't bend too easily. Um, yeah, so perhaps if you send me that in an email, I will remember to measure what the wall thickness is in the extensions that we're using. But we've been using them for years, a very long time, like 20 years now. And um, they are a bit heavy, but they do last and they are cheap, uh, which, of course, is very important. All right. Frank says, how do you know when your sails need replacing? Ooh, that is a good question. And it's quite a tricky one, really. Um, with Frank's got, uh, Frank's got a Prindle 15, which uses the coloured Dacron sails. And with the Dacron sails, the time when they need replacing is when the cloth has seen too much salt and too much UV and the cloth has started to degrade, which means it becomes very easy to tear. The only way you find out if the sail is very easy to tear is when it tears. Um, so it really is um, can't, unless you want to get new sails because perhaps your sails have started fading. They don't pop so much anymore. But having seen the pictures of your boat on Show Us Your Cat, I know that those sails are still popping. I don't think there's any need for you to um, replace your sails just yet, unless they do start ripping quite a lot. 
the jib would usually be the first sail that needs replacing because it's going to flap a lot more. And um, roughly, if for us out here using the boats every single day, I would expect to need to replace a jib after three years and a mainsail after five years. But they'll still have some life left in them, but um, just they'll have started fading a lot. And if they tear, then they can't really be repaired so well because um, if you stitch new cloth to really old tired cloth, there's going to be a very weak point there and it will basically tear again where it's been repaired. So that is when I would say you need to replace your sails. Okay, continuing. All right. Jeff Le French Breton from Hong Kong says you did a nice video of first event race. So you saw our start Hong Kong race video, didn't you? <laughs> I think I I think we did. I think it was um that must have been in a previous episode of Show Us Your Cat. Great stuff. Glad to see you getting some great sailing there in Hong Kong. Right, going on to the next preloaded question. And this one is, is one of these fun ones. This one comes from David. He says, it's a really tricky one, actually. He says, if you could only sail one cat for the rest of your life, what would you choose and why? All right, I think for those of you who've been tuning into these videos for long enough, I think you might know which two boats it's going to come down to. Uh, that is, of course, the, yeah, what's your name? Piz Seven, is, or is that Please Seven? Got a bit of a dirty screen. Oh, PLZZ-7 says, got to be the T. Yeah, you would think it's got to be the T, but of course, the other one it comes down to is the Hobie 16. What would it be, the Tornado or the Hobie 16? To be honest, I would have, if it's just one forever, it would have to be the Hobie 16. Sorry, Tornado lovers. But the reason for that is because the Hobie 16 has got a bit more versatility to it with when you can use it. If you haven't got a crew, if your crew's not very experienced, um, if it's really, really windy, um, if it's not very windy, it's still got that power to weight ratio that means it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, tickle along nicely anyway. I do, of course, love my Tornado uh, more than any other boat. But if it was just one boat forever and just one, it would be the 16. Thanks very much for that question. Quite a thought provoking one. I have been thinking about that. Uh, so there we go. We've got Zoopzula. Do you maintain your bottom wear area of the Hobie yourself? Um, to be honest, we don't have this bottom wear issue like people do sailing in other places because we never run the boats up the beach. We always use a launching trolley or a beach dolly to pull the boats out of the water. So we don't have this issue with the bottom of the boat getting ground away. So in the short answer, no, I don't. Okay, Stephen. And the Hobie has great coloured sails, number one. There we go. That was in a bit of an extra to which boat would you choose? All right. Frank says, I know you did a great video on crew education. If you don't have time to train a new crew, mate, what three tips would you give to this inexperienced crew before you take him out or her? All right. That's a good question, actually. I like that. Um, not that I'm surprised, Frank. Your questions are always uh, thought-provoking and uh, good. So what I would do, let's think, three tips for someone who hasn't sailed before. It does depend on if it's going to be windy or not. But I think the most important for someone new to sailing is to give them an idea of what it's going to be like. So that if it's like the day before, so that they know 
if it's going to be a white knuckle ride, spray in the face, uh, trapezing, uh, doing 20 knots, or if it's going to be going for a nice cruise around, look at the scenery, have a nice chat. So that would be tip number one. Give them some sort of expectation of what it's going to be like. Tip number two would be to give them an idea of what they need to wear. I think that's very important that they need to know what to wear. And then the third one is just what their role is on the boat with, um, all right, here's the jib. This is how you pull it in. This is how you cleat it. This is how you uncleat it. And, and then it's the job of the skipper to let the crew know when to pull in, let out and what have you. And then on the other hand, if it is going to be windy and they're going to be trapezing, then tip number one is definitely, well, we've still got the expectations, the what to wear, and then the this is how you trapeze. And then the last one will be this is what you do if it look if you feel that we are going to crash. <laughs> like if it's a pitch pole, just go with it. If it's a sideways capsize, try to jump for the back of the mainsail. And then if we are capsized, make sure you are holding on to the boat. There we go. Thanks, Frank. Frank says, can you do a video on building a cat tracks for a beach cat? Yeah, I think so. We could go into the anatomy of a big wheeled launching trolley. If, um, if you could put that in either in the main comments of this video or in an email, then I'll be able to put it on my list of videos to make, which is getting quite juicy now. And apologies for, by the way, uh, the lack of responses to comments in videos this week. We just have been extremely busy and I haven't had a lot of time. Um, so that is why. All right, continuing. We've got Rich. Rich has got that inflatable cat out in Man Mallorca, the Bloby, finding it's a bit underpowered. It's got a three and a half square meter jib, eight square meter mainsail. Question, will increasing the mainsail to 10 square meters make much difference? Yes, it will. I'd say it'd make a tremendous difference because it's the this Bloby is um, it's an inflatable boat, quite small. And if you compare it to the sort of numbers that you're talking about, uh, not totally dissimilar to the numbers that we'd be using kite surfing or perhaps windsurfing, uh, in which two square meters is going to make a fairly significant amount of difference to your amount of power that you have on the boat there. So, yes, two square meters will make a fair difference. But um, how are you going to do it? You're going to put on a bigger mast or perhaps get a, a sail which is cut differently. Nice idea. All right, David, hello. What to what do you attach the bottom of the downhaul so as not to affect the mast rotation? Oh, the bottom of the downhaul always gets attached to the bottom of the mast. So rather than attaching it to the front beam, it's attached to the mast, and that way it doesn't affect the mast rotation. Um, thanks for um, uh, all the questions, by the way. Very good to have you all here with us this afternoon. All right. All right, Bullfrush says, oh, tip number four for the crew, it's not personal. Is that when you start shouting at them? Um, so, uh, yeah, if it's windy, another one is at times it will be necessary to shout to be able to be heard communications wise. All right. Paul R says this is back to the crewing. I always like to do a capsize drill as one of the first things with somebody who is new. That's a really good idea. If you've got the if you've got the means to do a safe capsize drill, that's a very good idea. All right. All right, Rich with the Bloby says the sail will be cut differently, almost like a deck sweeper. We have got to see pictures of that. The deck sweeper style, that's going to put more sail area lower down as well. 
that's going to give you a lower center of effort that is going to make the boat quite a bit quicker so uh, i think it's a very good idea very nice right going back for another pre-loaded question in fact at this stage i think we're going to take a commercial break for everybody who's watching this later okay welcome back and the next preloaded question is from brett in maine usa who's got a nacra infusion and he says is there a term for the maneuver that takes you from close hauled to a broad reach answer to that part is yes we call that the bear away uh turning from upwind to down downwind is the bear away uh, we got caught out in a passing front with very strong winds during the turn the boat gained some speed and then as soon as we were downwind i stuffed it i believe stuffing it in this context would mean shove the nose in and maybe flip the boat over so the best way to get around this corner it is one of the most difficult things in high wind and quite intimidating is making this bear away without sticking the bows in or capsizing so i would say for me the way that i like to do it is as the helm i stay out on the trapeze get right to the back of the boat put my foot in that back foot strap if you've got one or if not just get really secure right at the back of the boat and then maybe before you go for the bear away um uh, get the crew to ease the jib that's going to take a lot of pressure off the bows of the boat if you've got dagger boards bring the dagger boards up before you bear away because otherwise the boat can trip over if you think this is your dagger board if you start bearing away you get a lot of pressure at the bottom which is going to push the bow of the boat down so bring the dagger boards up that's going to reduce that pressure before you bear away then what i would do then when you're ready for the bear away ease traveler and main sheet at the same time which might mean giving the traveler perhaps to the crew so they can ease the traveler out as you ease the main sheet out and ease more sail than you need to if at any point during the bear away the bow starts dipping just ease a load more sheets or traveller, or both, and that way you should get through that corner. But um, of course, staying out on the trapeze is a little bit, can I say, hardcore, a bit emotional, perhaps a lot of commitment for someone who's not used to it. You can use that technique from sitting on the boat, but certainly get as far back as you possibly can. There we go. Hello, Royal. Great to have you on board. Hello, Oscar. Hope it's all going well for you with your 20. All right, next question is coming from Tim in Florida. Tim is, of course, sorry, some sort of shenanigans afoot. Um, Tim's got a Hobie 16 in Florida, and Tim is asking, when the wind is blowing directly offshore, how do, what is the best way to get your boat your boat to turn enough so that you can sail away from the beach this would have been a good one for the whiteboard apologies for no whiteboard but um the problem is if you're trying to get your boat to turn enough to get it away from the beach if there's any wind the boat is going to power up and you'll start sailing back in towards the beach which is going to be not ideal so my quick answer is if the wind is offshore and perhaps also you might have a tight area to get out of like maybe between two breakwaters two lines of rocks or something and you just haven't got that space to make the bear away then what i would do is helm and crew opposite sides get the get the back of the boat right out of the water you could have your rudders down if you can get the back of the bear away with more space. Uh, for back who see the backward sailing video uh, very often, but when it is, I'll make a video about how to get away from the beach.
backwards. All right, nice one there, Tim. Hope you're having a good time. All right, we've got... Oh, Piz7... Oh, PLZZ-7 says, having some speed going definitely helps too. Yeah, so he's back to the bear away in high wind. If, you, if you've got a load of speed to get around that corner, which is also why staying out on the trapeze is going to help, that speed is going to take the pressure off the rig. Whereas if your boat is almost stopped, you're going to have a tremendous amount of pressure, which is going to make the boat feel a bit more capsizing. All right. Um, Jasmine, do you use soft shackles on your Hobie 16 or any cat? And where? What is the advantage? Thanks. Um, well, short answer, no. We don't use... Well, ba just to explain, what a soft shackle is, is basically a rope loop, which you have a uh, loop in one end, uh, some sort of knot in the other end, and it acts like a shackle, but it's soft because it's made of rope. We do use that, in fact, we do use that sort of strop on the clue of some of the bigger boats like our Tornado. We use that sort of strop where we put a ball through a loop um, and then it goes through the clue around the boom. And um, it's just the most practical way of attaching the boom to the clue. And then we sh uh, put the main sheet onto that, but we don't use it anywhere else. Thanks for the question. All right, we've got Graham on board. Have you ever sailed a GP14? No, uh, GP14 is a, a traditional sailing dinghy, um, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a boat that was sailed in the area where I learnt to sail back in the day. I used to sail a Wayfarer uh, and an Albacore, but not the GP. All right. Jerome or Jerome. Hello, Joe. What do you think of the idea of hanging a sort of rope under the mast foot to allow you to easily get back on the trampoline? Uh, yeah. So there is a technique that we've looked at, I think, in the how to get on your boat video, which is rather than having a separate rope with a loop in to get back onto the boat, what we would do is after the capsize, you've got your capsize line out. And then this is quite convenient because with it out, you can then after you've got the boat upright, you can then tie it around the center of your dolphin striker pull a load of tension on, tie it off, and then that becomes a handy step for getting back onto your boat. Uh, good question. All right, we've got Meltiades, who says, many thanks for your videos. I learned a lot of techniques from your channel in the Philippines. Thank you very much for letting me know. It's good to know that these videos are reaching pretty much the whole planet. Great stuff. And talking of the whole planet, we've got Glenn just tuning tuning in from the San Francisco Bay Area. Great stuff. Right. Next preloaded question. And this one comes from Wolf in Germany. And he says, how much easier does having a ratchet on your main sheet make sheeting the main? Should I use one? All right. So that's part one of Wolf's question. And I would say, Yes, absolutely, definitely, without fail, have a ratchet on your main sheet. The difference that it makes when, even in a fairly light wind, um, once there's a bit of pressure in the sail, if you haven't got a ratchet on your main sheet, I'd say it probably increases the effort that you have to pull the rope by, or to hold the rope at least, by about a third. So having the ratchet is essential. I've actually got a ratchet block here, um, as you might have expected. Um, and this is the type of ratchet block I would go for every time. This, unfortunately, this system, I believe, is now completely discontinued by Harken, but you can find these. So here's the ratchet block, is the one in the middle, and it's got texture on there which grips the rope, but it still allows the rope to slip through but it adds resistance to the rope. So when you sheet in, 
she clicks. That is the ratchet is engaged. And when you go to sheet out, there's just a bit of extra resistance there that makes it so much easier. Oh, yes. Um, on these ones as well, the ratchet is switchable. So you can switch the ratchet on and off. So with it off, there she goes. Nice. So if it's lighter wind, lovely. And then as the wind increases, turn the ratchet on. There we are. Yes, use the ratchet. Okay. And Wolf also asks, what purchase would you use um, if sailing a lot of different boats from 15 to 17 feet long? Um, so I would go for a six to one, I think, because any more, as you increase the purchase, you have to use more rope to make the same uh, changes to the amount of sail that you have in. So six to one, I would say, would be the sweet spot if you're using a ratchet block. If you find that six to one is a little bit, if you've got too much load when the wind is strong, then a seven to one, which not many people use a seven to one, but um, to get your seven to one, what you'd want to do is put a block on here because usually on a six to one, the rope would end here. But if you put a block on here, then have the rope instead of ending here, goes back up and ends at the top block. That will give you a seven to one, which will just give you that bit more purchase, which might make it a bit easier. So there we go, Wolf. I hope that that helps. All right. Graham asks a very important question. Are the Joyride shirts good for sailing? Um, unfortunately, the ones that I've got on the website at the moment are just normal cotton T-shirts. So not ideal for going sailing because, you know, as you know, with a cotton T-shirt, it's going to absorb some water and get heavy, take a long time to dry. The type that I'm wearing right now, this is the type that I want to stock on the website, but I'm not yet able to find a supplier uh, to do that. Um, so apologies. I, when I get some stock, I will let you all know because they are very good. All right, Stephen says, which rope thickness do you recommend for the Hobie 16 main sheet for the ratchet block? Yeah, what I, the, the perfect main sheet diameter is nine mil. Now, nine mil is also a very difficult main sheet diameter to come across. The ones that we use here, which I have to say is absolutely fantastic, is, right, you might want to write this down. It's Maffioli Swift Cord 9mm. Um, it's quite expensive, but it is so good. And we've been using the same rope on our 16 main sheets now for, I think it's got to be five years. And as you will know, um, these boats get one heck of a lot of use. So that really does prove what good rope it is. Um, yeah, nine mil Maffioli Swift cord. When it's brand new, like with any brand new rope, it will feel quite slippery because it has a waxy coating on the outside. But after a couple of hours of use, or there are methods to take that waxiness off, uh, like soaking it in soapy water, then um, it becomes a lot easier to grip in the breeze. Good question there, Stephen. All right, Graham says, what boat shoes do you wear? Okay, if it's not so windy, if it's not like, um, if I'm not going to put my helmet on, if it's not that windy, I'll generally wear the Zero Colorado sandals. I oh, know sandals for sailing, but they are really, really good. Uh, there's a link in several videos, and I did actually do a review video on those bad boys but they are really good. But if the wind is a bit stronger and I'm de definitely going to be getting into that Joyrider TV fast sailing position, I'll, I use uh, the brand is Gull, G-U-L, 
and the shoe is called Code Zero. And I really like those because they've got a soft compound rubber sole, which grips so well. And also they've got a lot of space for the toes, which is, um, I think that's important. A lot of wetsuit shoes, you do feel like you're getting squashed into them. Whereas these gull ones are very comfortable for a long period of time as well. So that is what I would recommend. All right, Axel says, what is the best way to create an adjustable trapeze system on a Hobie 16? Yeah, I would do that in the same way that we do on the F-18s, on the Tornado. I've done a couple of videos on this, actually, Axel, and I will, um, if you remind me in some way, I'll send you a link. You could remind me either by an email or um, in the, the comments below this video, then I'd be able to send you a link or just type it in um, adjustable trapeze system, uh, Hobie, Hobie. Yeah, that would probably do it. And that would be the one. All right. Graham says I'm 11 and start sailing a laser radial. Great stuff. Yeah, I'd go with those Gull Code Zero shoes. They'd be really good on the laser as well. So good choice there. All right. I've got another preloaded question. This is from Emil in France. Emil, we saw on Show Us Your Cat a couple of weeks ago with the Hobie 17 with the grey hulls. He says, why does loosening the rig on a Hobie 16 lose power? All right. So because the Hobie 16 doesn't have sophisticated means of losing power, we have to use a slightly more um, brutal method of getting rid of the power. You just off, dude? Yeah. All right. Nice one. Did yeah. um, Vittorio arrive? I don't know. OK. Well, I'll send him Mythos. Are you guys going out? Sorry about this. Um, I think the lads are going gear off. Are you yeah. going out or staying in? I'm probably going to stay in. All right. Well, I'll, I'll get him to knock on your door if he's um yeah. turns up. Right. Thanks for your <laughs> patience there. Um, all right. The question was, yeah, why does loosening the rig on a 16 lose power? Because what it does is it allows the rig, if that is straight up, allows it to fall away to leeward. So to go towards the leeward side of the boat. And what that does is it opens up the leech of the mainsail and the jib. It also means that the mast is going to come further back, which is going to stop you from putting the nose in as much. And um, it's just opening up the whole rig and allow it to breathe a lot more. There we go. All right. I've got one more preloaded question, and that is from Benas who says I'm planning to buy my first catamaran. I've got a decent amount of sailing experience. What do you think is the best choice of catamaran? Well, if you've got a decent amount of sailing experience, what you'd have to look at when choosing your first catamaran um, is what are you going to do with it? Are you going to be just sailing it off the beach? taking friends out having a lovely time maybe doing a bit of trapezing uh blasting around not racing so much um or do you live somewhere where there's a sailing club where people sail a specific type of boat if i would always say if there is a sailing club near to you which you are a member or you're thinking of joining, see what class of boat is largely sailed there. Because if you can sail the same class of boat as other people, you're going to have a much better time on the race course if you're in the same type of boat. So that is number one. Number two, are you going to be sailing with a lot of inexperienced crews? If you are, then I would say something like the Hobie 16, Prindle 16, Prindle 18, Dart 18 would be a good choice. Something that isn't quite as technical, especially as the crew. If you're going to be sailing with the same crew all the time and your crew is also an experienced dinghy sailor, then you might want to consider something a bit more juicy like uh, an F-18. If you're somewhere like 150 kilos, if you're lighter, maybe an F-16. Um, 
if you like something a bit classy, then the tornado will certainly do the business. But there you go. Some boat choices to have a look at. All right. So, Mel Diandis, where can we buy a complete set of Hobie 17 stay wires with shackles, mainsail, and trapeze hull, port and starboard, and trapeze, port and starboard, okay, all brand new. Hmm. Yeah, I would say um, check out, I would say go to the Hobie uh, website, I believe it's at hobie.com or Hobie say, uh, hobie.net, I think, think it might be, um, and then go to the where to buy or dealer network and find out who is the dealer in your area, and that would be a good starting point to go to to get hold of a load of kit for your boat. That's quite a lot of kit. Um, I don't know if Hobie is still, I dare say that Hobie are not, still making Hobie 17 sales, which means you might have to look at getting a sale made for your Hobie 17, um, which most sale makers would be able to do it. Check out the video on aftermarket sales, which sale makers to go to, but I don't know what would be the best choice for you in the Philippines. Um, maybe getting stuff from Australia isn't too juicy. Check out Hobie Cat in Australia and see what they can do for you. All right, Graham, please, can you do more virtual regatta? Oh, if only I had time. I absolutely loved that period with virtual regatta. So much fun. And it's if you haven't tried virtual virtual regatta you and you're into a bit of sailing racing, you absolutely have to try it because it is so accurate to the feeling that you get on the race course, the feeling that you get when you're playing virtual regatta for me was very similar to the feeling on the race course, that kind of bit of pressure and the tactics strategy, all that, give it a go. All right. Hayden, him talking about rig tension made me think of this. People that race the Hobie 14 have a line that goes to the force day so that they can touch Rig tension, mid-race, typically upwind and downwind. Do you know the reason for this? Mine being a turbo, I don't see myself doing this, but it made me wonder. No, I don't think they do it in the turbo because of the jib, but with the single sail, which is the um, way that the 14 is raced in the bigger competitions, I believe it's because on the upwind, the rig is being sailed pretty loose. And then, so, which means on the downwind, if you didn't have that lined tension to force stay, the rig would flop around quite a lot, disturbing your airflow. And also pulling the rig forwards on the downwind um, is going to give present more sail area to the wind, which is going to make you go faster. There we go. All right, Robin, it's okay. But you're late. Don't worry. It's okay. No problem. Kurosh, I always tell first times sailors that the boat will not sink if we capsize to ease the fears. That is another good point because to a first time sailor, they don't know. They might think that a capsize is game over, but it's actually quite normal. All right. 3581 toss it. Going cat sailing in Colorado at 9,000 feet elevation in August when the water will be about 55 degrees. Semi dry suit or dry suit and dry top or dry top. Oh, I don't know. I would take them all with you and uh, see what it feels like on the day. All right. And last question. That's it. Yeah. No further questions, please. I think we're pretty much there for today. Um, getting a windsurfing kit, I've never done it before. Do you have any tips and tricks for a beginner? Yeah, if you're starting windsurfing, I would recommend the biggest board that you can get hold of and quite a small sail, like to start with, like a four and a half meter sail or something. If the wind is going to be light, 
and you're going to be learning through the traditional methods. But a big, stable board is definitely going to reduce some of the frustrations that go with learning to windsurf. But the other thing with learning to windsurf, a tip, is just pay attention to your hands. Because if you're getting into it on your first couple of days, if your hands aren't particularly hard, um, you can very easily get blisters which will open and you'll get these, like, your hands will become quite sort of gashed, which um, makes it very uncomfortable to continue. So pay attention to your hands. All right, and Stephen's just backed that up, 150-litre windsurf board, if you can. All right, so the last one is Hayden. Follow-up question, why would you want to go up when with loose rig? Would the loose rig on a 14 not power the sail up, power the sail like a 16 would? No, um, so this loose rig is going to bring the rig further back um, and it's going to, allow you to point a bit higher on the upwind. Whereas if you've got your rig more forwards, it's going to power you up on the downwind. So I think I don't race a 14, so I might be a little bit off the mark here, but as far as I can see, um, it's so you can have the rig further back on the upwind, which is going to help you pointing and getting to the windward mark earlier. And then on the downwind, you'll be able to bring the mast further forwards, which is going to help you there all right jacob says for the person that asked that is 3581 toss it asked about dry suits i sail in areas where the water is normal about 50 degrees and a wetsuit is fine all right so there we go thanks very much everyone for tuning in um I'll be back on Sunday with Show Us Your Cat, of course, which I will be presenting. Thanks very much to Jeff for stepping in for the last one. And um, there'll be other stuff coming every day on Joyrider TV. If you want to support the channel, you could start off by just hitting like on this one. Um, you could also tell your friends to get involved, subscribe. You could head over to TotalJoyrider.com, uh, buy a T-shirt. Although they're not so good for in the water, they're very nice for out and about or perhaps just in the house, wherever you like. But thanks very much. And I'll see you soon with some more.